No? Okay, great. Hey, Data Bees, thanks for joining us this morning. Where are we joining from? Oh, wow, room's filling up fast. If you wanna go ahead and drop your location in the chat, we'd love to see where you're joining us from today. Good morning, good morning. I'm joining from the Bay Area. I'm Maddie Watt with The Hive. For those of you who aren't familiar with me yet, I'm gonna go ahead and go over the ground rules for today's webinar in just a minute. I'm just kind of giving it one more, like 30 seconds or so, because people are filling in the room and then we're gonna go ahead and jump in here. We're super excited for today's talk. We have some phenomenal minds behind all things marine and ocean and the business side of it and the sustainability side of it and all the different challenges that they're facing and hurdles they're overcoming and the amazing things that they're doing with technology and how that's changing the world and what we can expect to see in the future. Um, we're really, really, really excited to be giving this to you guys and just it's going to be a great show. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to just really quickly talk about, uh, again, the ground rules, and then I'll explain what the Hive Think Tank does. And then TM Ravi, the Hive's managing director and founder, is going to tell you guys what the Hive does as a funding entity. And then we're going to jump in. So real fast, uh, please be respectful in the chat. We love questions. But when you ask a question, please, 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 use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So I want everyone that's watching right now, go ahead and look at the bottom of the screen. There's gonna be a Q&A button. And that is where we really would like you to ask your questions. And that way it's all in one nice, neat place uh, for Marta, our moderator today, to go ahead and, and look at. And then you guys can actually upvote on each other's questions. So please don't ask them in the, uh, the chat. I always see people and I always have to chase you guys down. So please just go ahead and don't make me yell at you and uh, go ahead and use that Q&A button. Uh, and I can see that we've got some folks from Sebastopol and France holding it down. Awesome. Great. Okay, and so also for those of you who are wondering um, if you have any friends that weren't able to attend today, the session is being recorded and it's gonna be available on our YouTube later on. I will go ahead and drop the link for that and it will automatically be sent out to everyone who registered for this event, so don't worry. Uh, and last but not least, if you're gonna be on social media today, please use the hashtag HiveData and tag us at HiveData. At the end of the session, I will put out in a brief event survey, it's like five questions if you have 10 seconds to fill it out, that'd be awesome. It helps us make uh, even better events for you guys. And without further ado, about the Hive Think Tank. Uh, Ravi, it's, I think it's stuck still. But I can go ahead and, and tell you guys I got this uh, like the back of my hand. So the Hive Think Tank is an event and content platform. We are bringing you events basically every week, uh, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. We've gone totally virtual. And we also have a, a content platform on Medium. So I will drop these links in the chat. It is really important to join our meetup group if you wanna stay uh, up to date on the latest and greatest of what we're doing. So we're also covering all things, including AI, uh, health, 5G, uh, entrepreneurship, FinTech, InsureTech. Um, and we've been doing some really cool, great things lately uh, that are related to sustainability and technology. Um, Marta, our dear friend, helped organize this panel, and we're also doing another one with her coming up on ag tech, so that will be great. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, if you want to get involved in sponsoring the Hive Think Tank, please go ahead and email me. I will drop it in the chat. Um, or if you want to work with us on an event, if you have a really great idea, I would love to hear about it. And then last but not least, we've got... Okay, so this is really exciting. On the third, we're doing this awesome panel. We're starting a series with uh, Externalities Watch, which is based in France. It's a group. Um, our dear friend Pashu, who actually used to work at the Hive, uh, she is uh, part of that team over there, and she's helping bring these really awesome events about technology and kind of these um, these ideals and these promises and the big things that we're trying to do with technology, but how sometimes it can get away from us and how sometimes there are negative backlash effects. So how do we balance that? How do we go forward and uh, progress and have innovation, but more sustainably? So that way we aren't causing all these negative effects. If anyone's seen uh, the social dilemma, or I think they think it's the social network or the social dilemma, that's like a movie that covers about all these different things that social media does that can be negative. So there's a lot of uh, fallout that's happened from the goods of technology and how do we come back to a more um, balancing that sort of thing. So we're going to have an amazing panel and that is at 8 a.m. on December 3rd. And then the following week on Wednesday the 9th, we are going to have an incredible 
all woman uh, panel of ag tech leaders. These are business women who are founders as well as uh, experts in the agri tech uh, field. And they are going to talk about how the current boom in ag tech is not uh, what you would normally think. It's actually really new and unique disruption. So Marta, our dear friend, who's on today's uh, panel as our moderator, she's going to be moderating that one too. So I will drop these links. Without further ado, here is TM Ravi. Thank, thank you, Matty, and, uh, and a special welcome to the panel and all my friends in the in the U.S. and in France and places like Brest and Saint Maxime and 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 so forth. So very briefly, the Hive is a venture capital entity, and it's a particular kind of venture capital entity that is commonly uh, uh, known as a venture studio. So we work very actively with entrepreneurs to help them build companies. We're very focused on leveraging data and data-related techniques to, to drive kind of new opportunities, to drive transformation. And, and we, we are very thematic in focus. So we think a lot about SaaS applications, workflows, business processes around security, privacy, and digital risk, and so on. And, and across a broad set of industries. Um, so if you're going to be uh, tweeting today, please use the hashtag HiveData. And with that, I'd like to introduce my and our very good friend, Marta Bulaic, who is uh, 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 kind of a strategist, a marketeer, has, is very active uh, uh, over a long period of time with uh, VCs, with startup companies, with corporations, and, and really is just an amazing kind of thinker. And you saw that we're also doing another event with her around AgTech. Uh, we did an event, uh, I, I would say probably a year back with Marta on women in robotics at Swissnex in, in their beautiful location and just off the water in San Francisco. So with that, uh, let me mel wel uh, welcome Marta. Maddie and Robbie, thank you so much. It's always an honor to present here at The Hive. Today, I'm very excited to moderate the panel on the next wave of Blue Tech Innovations. And I have an exceptional panel. I have a former Navy captain, I have a former NASA scientist, and I have a former film producer that are all doing the incredible innovations in Blue Tech. So I'd like to kick it off by doing introductions as having each, each panelist introduce himself and herself. But I'll start with you, Zdenka. Good morning, Maddie. Thank you for having me. So I am Stanka Willis, and uh, as Maddie said, I retired from the Navy uh, as a captain. And following my Navy career, I spent 11 years as a senior executive at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, building the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System. And I'm here in this role as the president of the Marine Technology Society. MTS has over 2,000 members in 20 countries, and we're devoted to fostering the different uses of marine technologies, uh, within the research, government, industrial, and military sectors. And Yi Chao, tell us about how a NASA scientist got to Blue Tech. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I, um, I got my PhD in ocean sciences. Um, I got my first job working for NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. I've been studying ocean using computer models. And this is back old days before uh, cloud computing become a household name using a program the school doesn't teach anymore. Some of you may be still using it as Fortran. Um, spend a decade launching satellites, monitor oceans from space. Um, I r running into this technology problem about 10 years ago, almost by accident, and then putting together a team, developed IP, developed a prototype. And then about five years ago, get so excited to commercialize this technology. So I left NASA, uh, start C Track, try to transition the research prototype to commercial applications. Thank you. Amazing. And then Stephen, a, a former film producer, now CEO, tell us more. Yeah, thank you very much. And good morning to everybody out there. Um, I began my journey uh, creating documentaries and different uh, media properties uh, working in New York and San Francisco uh, for various online startups um, like Vox Media, 
then more traditional companies like Discovery Channel uh, and was, had a stint at Reddit in between that. And um, found myself working in virtual reality as it was emerging as a broadcast medium. Uh, and got very curious about the technology and discovered that combining virtual reality with floating in water is a very, very powerful combination. And immediately recognized that there was some great potential for this combination um, and received interest from uh, water parks that wanted to buy this technology. And out of that, we created a company that now deploys virtual reality installations at resorts and water parks all over the world. We're in 15 countries at the moment um, and have recently um, delivered, we, we just crossed the mark of 600,000 paid experiences out there in the world. So um, yeah, uh, you know, very curious about sharing experiences. That's always been my passion. And Ballast is, uh, you know, the, the, the best implementation yet that I've been able to uh, produce in that, in that realm. So I know we're all lining up to go to these water parks. What I'd like to do it, before we dive into that is I'd like Zdenka to give us a framework about the blue economy. This isn't new. Um, it's been around, but it's the blue tech that's, that's driving a lot of this today. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen here because I feel the ocean is so visual as are these technologies and I want Stanka to just walk us through a little bit around the history and where where she thinks it's going and then we'll show pictures as well of the technologies from both Yi and Stephen. All right thanks Marta so I'm, I'm actually going to do a little bit of a history lesson so it's interesting to see how this term blue economy and how we think of our oceans so if we go back to 1964 the National Academies of Science, the National Research Council, published a report, and it was entitled The Economic Benefits of Oceanographic Research. And, but in that report, the message is the ocean as non-finite. The focus was on extraction and exploitation. There was no Clean Water Act, no Clean Air Act, no Stratton Commission, and no NOAA. So let's jump forward to 2012. National Academy of Science uh, study, this time called Ecosystem Services and Charting a Path to Sustainability. And so now we focused on a very different message, that the natural environment provides enormous value, but it's largely underappreciated. Services that aid humans and other earthlings. It's become clear that these life support systems are faltering and failing worldwide due to human actions that disrupt nature's ability to do beneficial work. So the conversation had shifted. The ocean is no longer thought of as a non-finite resource. We are focused on sustainability. We're focused on ecosystem services and we're focused on the ocean health. And so we want to start to talk about the oceans as a shared resource. How do we do that? How do we manage that regionally, nationally, and worldwide? And so how do we do that in the face of this term blue economy? Okay, so there remains no international agreed definition and terms are used interchangeably. We to mean different things. We hear blue economy, blue growth, blue green economy, and ocean economy. But there is a constant theme, and that's the importance of oceans, coastal, and ecosystems resources to our economies, and that we need to do that in a sustainable way. I think the seminal report that most people often quote is the OECD report, The Ocean Economy in 2030. And so a couple of numbers from that report. The economic output and employment valued in 2010 was a very conservative 1.5 trillion. And it's predicted in 2030 that the contribution will reach over 3 trillion. And in 2010, offshore oil and gas accounted for one third of the total of the ocean based industries, followed by maritime and coastal tourism, maritime equipment and ports. But it also looked about the industries that have the greatest potential to grow in the future. And a lot of that is in renewable energy wind energy, marine aquaculture, tourism, 
fishing processes and port activities. So what has the government done with regard to blue economy? Oh, and let me mention, I think that even more important than the numbers in that OECD report is here are four statements that I took as being really important to what we're talking about today. Ocean-based industries um, have the potential to outperform growth in the global economy. The driver behind the development of ocean industries is science and technology. Ocean observing is the cornerstone of ocean science. So we're not gonna get there without these industries. So just a couple of more points before we get to the exciting technology. So what has the government done? For example, NOAA formed a Blue Economy Subcommittee as a federal advisory committee in late 2019. And they've just put out a report in June of 2020 about talking about the importance of organizations like NOAA to be the catalyst for that support into the blue economy. And the other thing that has um, come, at, come up, it came up in our Oceans Conference um, about a month ago, is that there is investments out there for the blue tech and the marine tech. Uh, David Hume, a young man who um, has the website and the, um, the liquid grid, and he's developed a marine clean tech innovation ecosystem uh, portal, interactive, and he's got over 100 incubators, accelerators, clusters, and competitions all focused on this marine technology. So I think that's really exciting. I've had a chance to work with a few like Canada's Ocean Super Cluster, the Ocean Exchange, and the Seaworthy Collective. So I'll stop there. We can get into the technology and then we'll chat um, as we look at where we're going in the future. Thank you, Zenka. That was amazing background for us to get perspective. I'd like to introduce, have Yi talk about how do we measure the ocean and how difficult it is in order to make this blue economy work. So Yi, give us the perspective of the data, the gathering data challenges, and what Trek is doing. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks, Zenka, for that uh, great uh, history lesson. Uh, as you all know, data is extremely important to uh, support all the decision makings to support the blue economy. Um, you all know, um, we know so little about our ocean. We know more about the surface of the moon or even Mars than our own sea floor. Very uh, small percentage of the ocean floor has been mapped. So part of the challenges to collect data from ocean is because of logistic challenges. It's very hard to get to, it's huge, it's big, and there's no grid, there's very expensive ship required, as you'll see from Stenka slice. Uh, so if you look at this graph in a, you know, start 200 years ago, uh, we are starting to collect data, uh, you know, collect water from the bottles to measure water properties. And you can see it's very slowly increasing as we're building more and more modern ships in the, in the 50s and the 60s. Starting in the 70s, uh, thanks, thanks for the satellite technology, we start launching ocean satellites to measure ocean from space. And we can measure temperature from space today. I spent 10 years in NASA, developed the first satellite to measure salinity from space in the, about 15 years ago. Uh, we can measure ocean wind, we can measure productivity. Um, so satellite provide for the first time a global view of the ocean, taking snapshot of the ocean every, every week or so. Um, it, regard, even though satellite is great, but they can only detect the very surface layer of the ocean. So the ocean is three dimensional, they changing every day, every hour, uh, because of the weather, the tide, uh, climate, uh, changes um, is really the three-dimensional data we're missing today and then the last part of the graph you see in the last a decade or so we see this revolution of underwater robotics start to deliver data at an unprecedented rate so we are collecting data 10 times more in the last decade and in the past 200 years so I see this continuation growth of the underwater robotic where we turn the data uh, complementary to the satellite. So you will get this continuous uh, data collection, data access um, to a better supportable economy in the coming decades. 
So Yi, I'd like to just showcase some of the pictures of the C-TREK technology so people can have a perspective of how do you collect this data? Yeah, part of this robotic, and you know, one of the biggest challenges for underwater robotic is how to power them. We don't have the plug and the, like uh, your Roomba in your, your room. When the battery runs out and come back to the base station, get charged and go back and then do their submission again. Uh, underwater is extremely difficult to uh, provide electricity. Uh, typically, you need a big ships. You recover this robot when the battery runs out and you basically swap the relatively low cost battery, but the high end ships with a lot of people on board, uh, traveling away from the coastline is extremely uh, expensive and then logistic challenging sometimes. It becomes the weather, the storms. Uh, so c -Track, about 10 years ago, we start to address this energy limitation, developing uh, energy harvesting uh, technology we can generate electricity from the temperature difference in the ocean by itself. So the picture showing here is a module SeaTrack is commercially marketing starting this year. They can serve as a, almost like a backpack to attach to the robots and then provide the green continuous energy uh, to enable persistence monitoring at a sustain, in a sustainable way at a, at a reducing cost for the data collection in the ocean. Next slide, Marta. Certainly. Another example, this is, a, this, is a, this is a system we are developing right now. We are on track to release this product next year, is to power underwater gliders. This glider is powered today by batteries. When the battery runs out, you're looking for the biggest ship nearby to change batteries. So we are developing this um, uh, back, almost like a backpack and um, it's on, under the belly of the gliders. And then essentially as you glide in the ocean, you convert temperature difference into electricity. You charge uh, your system, you power your sensors, you power your satellite communication. So the goal is this robots powered by renewable uh, energy can continuously uh, carry out the mission without a human in the loop and then we call uncrewed autonomous system. This is a way to scale up the robotic to return another order magnitude, even a hundred times, a thousand times more data back to, uh, to the command center to support decision making. I love that the solution is by the ocean and for the ocean, that you're able to harvest what's unique to the ocean in terms of temperature differences and then to power all the type of equipment we would need to gather data. So that's pretty sexy energy harvesting technology. Um, Stephen has one of the hottest technologies as well with VR. Ironically, VR hasn't taken off in a lot of areas, but in yours, it seems like you may be the hottest ticket in town for VR. Tell us about how this is, how, you know, tech like VR is gonna offer what you talked about before about these experiences with the ocean. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in the context of our conversation today, um, the, the, the thing that's really important to us is that we are giving experiences to people that otherwise would never have an interaction with the ocean. So we, you know, our, our bread and butter is that we install experiences in water parks, and you can go ahead and, and go to the next okay. slide. Um, this is what our systems look like when they're installed in these water parks or the, the hotel resorts around the world. And imagine that these experiences are being offered in a country that is landlocked, right? Where um, a lot of the, the population may not ever have been to the ocean or has never even put a snorkel on before. Um, you know, I've been in the water with, with folks that have never put their head underwater before, but this technology is drawing them in, they're curious about it, and they want to try a new experience. So what happens in the top left frame here is, is a product that we call Diver. This is our first product that we made, and this is VR snorkeling. So people put on a VR headset that is calibrated to use water as part of the lens uh, so that um, when they put their head below water, the image all of a sudden becomes clear and they're snorkeling through ocean reefs, through shipwrecks, alongside whales, uh, they can float through space or do a skydiving experience. So anything that really takes advantage of that feeling of zero gravity is, is wonderful here. Um, and then we've also put VR on water slides uh, and then added a, a, a motor to the diver system so that people get physical feedback as they're doing these experiences. And we're a company that's about 
th just over three years old now. Uh, and we've had great success in deploying these products because the water park market is looking for technology and we're able to install these systems relatively easily and, and through our design process on these products uh, with a kind of technology focus on the back end, we've made them extremely easy to operate, extremely easy to monitor. And so we've kind of applied a Silicon Valley mindset to the way that these products are designed. Uh, and that's given us a, a really great edge in being able to deploy these systems fast and, and pretty widely all over the world. And, and this, this uh, slide speaks to the kind of the data that, that lies in the back for us. So um, every time we do a deployment, we're able to monitor all of the activity that happens through the headsets. We're, we're able to see what experiences are popular with guests. Um, and the, the graph in the upper left corner shows our activity on a daily basis. Um, this is a recent snapshot from our deployments all around the world. And you can see what happened during COVID. But the, the, the hopeful thing here is that as soon as parks were able to reopen again, they rebounded very, very quickly. Um, and there's a lot of reason to, to be hopeful for the water park industry at large, um, but for people's appetites to, to continue doing these experiences even uh, during a pandemic. So, um, you know, I think what we bring to the table is, is this access to distribution to people to, to allow them to feel a connection with the ocean and to allow them to be reminded of, of what is happening in our oceans. And so if we can you know, even use data from, from Yee's um, uh, robots and, and submersibles uh, and, and tell a story that really brings something back from the ocean to, to these people, perhaps we can change legislation. Perhaps we can um, you know, make people more invested in what is actually happening out there. And I think you brought up a really good point that you know, we know more about our moon's surface than we do about the, the bottom of the, the seas. That's because we have a great reminder in the sky every night, right? The moon is, is, is um, visible to everybody. We understand that it is a goal for us to reach and to want to go to. Uh, and that's simply because you know, it's more present in our day-to-day our -day consciousness. And so if we can bring oceans more into people's consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis, I think you know, there's a lot that we can do to, to garner support and um, further the exploration of our oceans. I have two questions for you, Stephen. What was the most popular item that, or animal life that uh, uh, customers wanted to see here? Was it the jellyfish and the whale, or is it octopi? What's, what's happening there? I, I, I think uh, in our ocean experience that we have deployed right now, um, the, the, the experience ends by being surrounded by humpback whales. And this is actually something that we created in uh, a computer CGI format. Um, that was modeled off of an experience that my co-founder had when he was doing research uh, diving to deploy um, camera systems in the Maldives. And um, uh, basically, he at, at some point um, when he was scuba diving for one of the very first times in his life, he found himself surrounded by humpback whales. Wow. And the, they all started singing in, in sync. Uh, and he fe felt that vibration in his chest as they were all singing right around him. And so that was kind of one of the original moments of inspiration is that we wanted to take that experience that he had, which is a very rare and incredible experience that most people will never get to have in their lives, and try to bring a piece of that to people. Um, so we're, we're continuing to work on our technology to bring sound and vibration into the experience because I think that's still a point where we want to get to where you can actually feel the whales vibrating against you. Um, and I think that that ends up being the most popular with people just because it is one of those encounters that you cannot have very easily in real life. So VR is a lot like hacking into your brain and giving you experience you've never had before. How does it transform a person? Is there a heightened elevation around um, uh, conservation, education? What are you seeing at that? Or what are like your advisors or pioneers in VR saying with that? Yeah, so uh, earlier this year, we actually participated with Stanford University on a study that took a look at people's um, uh, compassion for the ocean uh, after watching different formats of media. So they showed people a normal video of uh, ocean conservation material. 
They showed them a virtual reality piece on land, uh, and then they showed them a VR piece in the water. And they were, they were looking for, for two things there. They were looking to test um, what, what impact VR in water has on motion sickness. So our hypothesis originally was that VR um, in water essentially eliminates any motion sickness. And that was found to be true. Um, people experience a higher degree of vector change. So they think that they've traveled further in virtual reality in water than they might believe that they are in any other format. Um, and they also have a, a higher degree of um, compassion and, and empathy because they feel like they've been a part of that environment. Uh, and so just by taking that extra step and putting virtual reality in water to, to completely take over your senses and, and put you in a different environment, um, it really has a heightened effect on what the experience means to people and, and the way that it lingers in their mind after the fact. Really exciting work that you've done here. One of the things that we're definitely seeing here is the oceans themselves are going through a digital transformation and part of this happens to be with access. Going back to you, Zdenka, as you framed up our, the history, where do you see it, the blue economy going? What are you most excited about? And what are you concerned about? So I think there are a number of um, a number of elements of where where it's going. We certainly are seeing the incubators and accelerators and the hubs. You know, we're seeing that hit the blue tech market, and we're certainly seeing the philanthropy um, uh, money that's coming and starting to come into this market uh, or into this field. But I still worry that we, you know, we're not connecting. We're not connecting with. Um, communities as to the importance of this resource. And, and you know, Stephen is talking about how you connect to those communities and how do we connect to all communities, in particular the underserved communities who are getting most affected by changes at our oceans and coasts and don't have that understanding. Um, I think that uh, in addition to the oceanic robotic revolution, we need, we as a community, need to take these instruments and not think of them as just scientific um, toys, if you will, that we need to get that more, you know, uh, make them into almost commodities. And so that we can get the cost down, we can get the, the um, standards in place that allow us to get this um, equipment and into the ocean to be able to do all kinds of missions. So I still worry that we're a bit, you know, focused on the um, uh, one of a kind scientific type of equipment, which is important, at, but we need to do what the aerial drone community did, where they, you know, have reliable parts and standard parts and it's easy to put together and it's easy to use. So those are some of the things that I think about but in general, I think it's a very you know, robust and rosy picture. Um, certainly the awareness on the ocean, the United, you know, the UN decade of the ocean starting um, this next year. I think all of that's important to really focus um, the attention on this precious resource. And you, you had talked about measuring the ocean, but your technology of being able to power that is one use case where else do you see power in the ocean being applicable? What are these new markets and opportunities for Sea Trek? Yeah, this is an exciting time. I think uh, Stenka made a good point about aerial vehicles. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, when I worked for the government, um, the, the air, aero drones, it's a similar stage today as underwater drones. is a big, is expensive is res for researchers, for militaries and then require dedicated engineering to make it work, to really fix them before the, every flight. Um, we see this uh, transformation from the research military to commercial uh, consumer base, and then kind of open the box, turn key, you, you get a thousand dollar drones, you fly and take pictures from your friend's backyard or something. So we are really see this transformation, aero drones, and I think this panel bring us together, work with 
people like Stephen, it's really exciting to uh, to combine these different um, fields and then to explore the intersection between the different technologies and then to combine them to bring this data, uh, you know, expanding our capability, not only measure uh, water properties, but we can carry optical, optical sensors to bring pictures and videos. We can carry uh, acoustic sensors to bring the sounds of the sea back to the people. And then so the Stevens technology is a vehicle to translate that from kind of experts and data portal to average citizen uh, away from the ocean and then give them the experience, kind of bring ocean to them um, I think COVID teach us a lesson is uh, logistically it's difficult to go to the aquariums and they have to be shut down is not many everybody can travel to those places but in the future I see the data will be bringing back in real time and then through the VR experience and I grew up in the uh, away from the ocean I never touched the water until my college year so I can imagine the kids today in the next decade where have that experience of the ocean without traveling to, to, the, to the coastal cities. I love this theme of access that both you and Zdenka has presented. And Stephen, when I first met you, I, I, I immediately hearkened back to my childhood days of my brothers and I going around the TV set anytime Jacques Cousteau was on, because that was the ultimate excitement. It was something that we thought was even as exciting, if not more exciting than the man landing on the moon. And then we had David Attenborough, and I, I feel like you're this con continuation of this uh, or ocean exploration 2.0 of access to every uh, to everything for access for everyone. How do you see content playing an ongoing role? Will content be one of the best ways to do this? Um, VR certainly looks quite in, you know, intoxicating here. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, yeah, you bring up a great point, which is that um, I think you know, maybe my generation, uh, their largest exposure to the ocean in the last 10 years is Blue Planet and Blue Planet 2 through Netflix. Um, and these series are, are incredible ways for us to get a peek into worlds that are foreign to us, right? Um, but, but what we're trying to do is take that one step further and, and not only have, give you that mental connection, but, but to make you feel like you've been there um, and to give you that lingering memory as if you've actually visited one of these places. Uh, and so, you know, I think for us, um, it, it is not only about making that connection for people, but giving them reasons to come back and, and do multiple different types of experiences. We've, we've just finished up um, our first meditation piece, which is the, uh, the jellyfish that you saw in the last slide. And what that is, is uh, uh, it's a 17 minute piece where you have uh, jellyfish and other bioluminescent creatures floating in front of you, uh, instructing you how to breathe in a certain rhythm. And it is an incredibly relaxing experience. Uh, and so, you know, we're, what we're doing here is we're trying to, again, bridge the connection to the ocean, but use that to inform people's mental health and, and to, to have them relax. Uh, so we're now, you know, doing studies uh, with therapists that are looking to use technology in uh, their therapy sessions. And we hope that this is something that can be a regular tool for people to use so that they can get in touch with, with not only, you know, the visuals that, that the ocean has to offer, but um, just a different environment that, that produces a sense of relaxation and, and personal wellness as well. I love that you use jellyfish. Every time I go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I feel like in that area, I could just, I'd want a wall of jellyfish in my home to meditate. So now I can just use it with VR. One of the challenges in blue tech that I see on the venture side is there's really not a lot of funding going into the space. Uh, a few oceanic robotics have gotten funding, some aquaculture. You tell us about your journey in getting funding. How has that worked for you? Well, it's a, it's a new space, right? So uh, I, I came in to uh, the, the startup company from a, a slightly different angle from the traditional Silicon Valley model. I started with uh, a government research and developed IP, spent millions of dollars of government funding to do R&D. And we kind of start our journey with our patent in hands 
and then try to explore this uh, emerging market. And then it's just not, we are not ready for the traditional VC funding. Uh, we are very fortunate to met a few uh, visionary uh, uh, private foundations and then uh, the Teal Foundation Breakout Lab in the, in the San Francisco, uh, Eric Wendy Schmidt Foundation, the Schmidt Marine T um, Technology Partners. Those are the red early uh, founders recognize this technology, look at the potentials, and then give us a head start and then to further refine the product and then develop uh, the technology. We are a hardware company. Uh, we are in an emerging space. Um, we need a lot of time to push the product out of the door and then mature them and then getting the early customers, uh, getting that feedback and refine them. And then the iteration cycle is longer than you know consumer product and software. So that's require more funding. We'll continue to get government small business innovative research funding, SBIRs. And, and then we start to the typical friend and family round early on, find other relatives and cousins who can write checks. And um, <laughs> um, our cap table is huge and, uh, because the people write small checks. And, um, and then we, uh, about two years ago, we start getting angel investors. And then this year we just closed the angel investing groups and multiple uh, people around the country. And then as, I'm really uh, excited to um, to receive the check from someone I never know during COVID, and then because people watch my pitch, and then they invite me to um, pitch to uh, Andrew Group in Montana, the Frontier Angels, and then I never met. So they have 14 members out of their 50 people, and then form a C-Track LLC to invest our seed round. So it's very excited. Blue Angel from Boston. So it's really interesting raising money uh, during COVID. And hopefully in a year or two, we'll be growing in the commercial. The blue economy is uh, emerging, as Stenka mentioned, decade of the ocean. I think we are ready for the Silicon Valley VCs in about 18 months or so. And one thing I love about Yee's latest group of investors is three out of the 12 own wineries. So there we go. We, maybe that's going to be our future of funding. And Stephen, you have a completely novel approach to funding as well, right? No VCs. That, that, that's right. Yeah. At, at, so to date, we've never taken on any outside funding. Um, when we started this company, we had received interest from the water park market and we're lucky enough to find our first customer in Germany that was interested in this technology and, and how it applied to their business. So we were able to essentially fund our business with our first installation and from day one um, have remained profitable since then. And you know, that, that's uh, not for lack of being scrappy and for doing things in a certain way that allow us to kind of do things on our terms at the moment. But for me, it was really important that we took these products out into the world and proved their validation uh, to, to prove their use, to prove that the technology worked, and, and to prove that they were reliable systems uh, before we were, went out looking for any funding. So we've decided to, you know, to keep this um, a wholly owned business by, by myself and, and the partners that are involved. Um, and I think that allows us to, to kind of you know, take our time in the development and not have to worry about reaching the scale that would be required if we had taken on venture capital right away. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. And as we, we look to expand, I think there's different strategies for us going forward, but at least now we know exactly what the value of our products is and we can speak better to that. So, um, you know, not opposed to, to financing in the future to, to help us reach scale, but um, I think it was important for us to get it right in the early days without the pressure of having to demonstrate uh, certain capabilities before we were ready to. Got it. And we have a question. So this is going to be likely directed to you from an anonymous attendee who's working on an inexpensive robot. And he, his question is, you mentioned Mentioned energy harvesting is one of the issues. While there are some techs that are starting to deal with this issue, there is also another issue, communications. The only truly available tech globally is satellite, which is still too expensive to create commodity solutions that you talked about. Is there any progress in solving that? Great question. Um, 
majority of our robots have to come to the surface to talk to the satellites through the modem uh, we installed. And then uh, there's, there's 30, 40 communication satellite you can communicate anywhere in the globe. It's expensive, it's uh, limited. We are uh, paying at uh, every bit we're sending through the, the system. Um, it is true there's a limited uh, network for acoustic communication on the regional level. You can install uh, almost the cell towers using acoustic uh, uh, communication. Uh, there are increasing amount of uh, 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 infrastructure request and then to establish underwater communication. And again, is energy uh, is a major limitation as well. So if we solve the energy problem, the next biggest problem uh, limitation is communication. And then if we can have enough energy, we can power enough towers and repeaters underwater. And there is a article in the Economist magazine in the future we are envisioning uh, millions of these robots in the ocean, they all have ability to relay acoustic signals and then transfer messages and then eventually relate to the surface and go to satellites. So acoustic communication energy is um, it, it, it's helping and, and I think in the future we'll be improving in terms of uh, cheaper commodity based robots and have ability to relay their uh, data and images through uh, acoustic repeaters and then back to, um, uh, to your smartphone. Great question, thank you, Yi. Stanka, what types of opportunities do you see blue tech startups having with the government? And is there any advice you would give them? I think that the government is starting to understand that the traditional acquisition processes need to, um, need to change to be able to support rapid um you know rapid acquisition uh the department of defense has a you know defense innovative innovation unit which has special authorities that allow them to rapidly um acquire uh technology that they need not and and it can have you know certainly a marine tech question i mean it's broad for the department of defense the National Science Foundation uh, has been launching a number of large programs in looking at how to help researchers understand what it means to be an entrepreneur and how you acquire those skills. They have something called i -Core, Innovation Core. They also have an accelerator program that is tied to their top 10 big ideas. So one of the things that, you know, Oceans isn't necessarily in the top 10 of the NSF's um, big ideas, but data and artificial intelligence are. So you start to see that the, and, and the Air Force has some accelerator programs. One of the things that the US Group on Earth Observations is doing is in fact, looking for these types of accelerators and incubators as part of the National Plan for Civil Earth Observations to understand what that landscape is and perhaps how can we, the government, be you know, more engaged. So I think there's a, a recognition. There is still the, uh, as Yi will tell you, um, there is still the mostly traditional you know, grants and SBIR programs, which have unfortunately too long of a lead time for most of the entrepreneur. But that recognition is at least coming. And so hopefully we can advance that conversation. Interesting. And so here for venture capitalists, they're always looking at exits. And both of you, both of your companies, Stephen and Yi, are in hardware. And if I can quote Alan Kay, famous computational guy. People who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. Hardware isn't easy. Um, what exits, Yi, have you seen in Blue Tech? Well, there's a traditional exit strategy when I go to the pitch and then the people ask, what's your ex exit strategy? And then I, I, I always said, um, there's a traditional way of exit. Basically, you grow your company for 30 years and then you retire yourself to the defense contractors and then they continue to get defense contract. That's certainly the majority of the blue tech company in the last three decades. 
And I think uh, this is really the right decade to changing that business model. I think uh, this panel, it's a start. And then working, talking to people like Steven, try to, how do you bring this really exciting uh, new data stream to the people and uh, expanding from the traditional defense and military and government funding model. And then to even go beyond the traditional industry, uh, beyond oil and gas, and then looking for aquaculture, moving offshore farming, uh, microalgae to provide biofuels, uh, seafloor mining, and underwater communication, as we talked about early on. And then even um, bring the data sets in, into a consumer space. And then if you think about opening your smartphones and looking for Google Maps and then looking for the next Starbucks, you know, near the neighborhood. And, and then it's, it's not unrealistic to think about a decade from now, you can use your smartphone and to, to look for the next interesting fish and sharks and then your favorite animals and you will look at and have experience. And then, so that certainly is coming. I think this panel along with other programs Stenka highlighted will help us to accelerate that pace is really go beyond the traditional model and then to expand the blue economy. And this is have to be the way to, uh, uh, to expand our, our, our network and existing ecosystem. So I want to go to what uh, my friend Josh Constein, who used to be the editor of TechCrunch and is now at a fund called Signifier, he always asks founders about their super founder origin stories, which is one of my favorite things he asked. For Yi, you talked about your background, you'd never been at the ocean, and people call you now the armchair oceanographer, right? So it's a new name nickname you have. Um, you, you were working as a NASA scientist, you get CSEC, you're a computational oceanographer, why did you become an entrepreneur later by Silicon Valley standards? What, what compelled you to do this? Well, I tried to avoid the ocean as an oceanographer from day one because I, um, I cannot survive at sea. I went to a research cruise for a week and then I, I had to stay outside all the time. So certainly I cannot go out for long endurance missions. So I tried to study from ocean, uh, ocean using computers for the first decades and then spend the next decade to study ocean from space and then you don't need to go out to sea. And, and then now I'm getting underwater robotics. So my goal is to send robots, millions of those into the ocean. And I get Steven's head air, you know, uh, VR set and then I'm watching the data live from my, my home. Stephen, I don't meet a lot of film producers become Silicon Valley CEOs. Uh, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, for, for me, I, I grew up in San Diego and kind of had an inherent connection to the ocean from an early age. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in my life, I, I went to UCLA, uh, studied filmmaking there, moved to New York for a little while and, and got sort of um, and a hands-on MBA in building a business and producing media at the same time with a company called Vox Media, which is, is now responsible for many different web websites that people are familiar with. Um, and yeah, as, as, I, as I kept growing in my film and media career, um, you know, realized that what my true passion was, was, was capturing experiences and sharing those with people. And so as virtual reality emerged, um, I became very curious about it, uh, started working in that format, telling stories in virtual reality. And one night was watching an episode of Stranger Things on Netflix, where there is a scene where Eleven, one of the main characters, is in a sensory deprivation tank with sort of a space helmet on to help her breathe in the water. And, and for me, that was the light bulb moment, which was, let's combine virtual reality and water to give people this sensation that they're in a completely different place, um, whether it's space or the ocean. Um, and it was just a crazy enough idea to, when, when I went out to dinner that night with a friend who is an incredibly talented engineer, um, it was just a crazy enough idea to, for him to say, let's do it, let's build a prototype. And the next morning we had a prototype built, which a few days later was then shown to uh, Jeremy Balenson at the, the Stanford VR lab. And, um, and he confirmed that we had something that was very special. Uh, and so that was that was enough to to start, you know, making it a side project, which then six months later became its own company. And and I actually ended up having to turn down a job at Google at the time, 
um, and quit my, my full-time job to take this leap of faith and move to a German water park to see if we could actually make this technology work. Um, so it, it quite a, quite a non-traditional uh, story, but has been the experience of a lifetime and kind of, you know, when, when people talk about things matching up at the right moment um, with the right people, it, it really feels like serendipity in a lot of ways and, and, and something that I'm, I feel called to do. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Great. And I have two more questions uh, from the same person who asked about satellites. Yi, do we know about the impact of acoustic communications on marine life to continue to use this type of network that you mentioned? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, as we are uh, uh, having more sensor capabilities and with more hydrophones in the ocean, we can detect the ocean sounds from both natural and man-made uh, sources. Uh, you will be surprised uh, how much noise or the shipping and then coming through uh, as a competition oceanography have been uh, tried to include uh, sound into the computer models. And then in the future, I do envision there will be a real time monitoring of the sound. So every container ship passing by, you will know how loud it can be. It's overwhelm every, everything else signals, a uh, little uh, yacht passing by or the shark and, and the whale swimming by as well. As we getting communication closer in the short distance, uh, the, certainly the signal strength is relatively small. Uh, so, so this is a trade between how fast, how far away you wanna communicate and how strong the signal can be. And so it, from a conservation point of view, it's really monitoring and, and a part of the enforcement as well. So we wanna be a sustainable, responsible, uh, for the marine life, certainly we don't want to create too much noise just to, for the sake of monitoring. So that's part of the goal. I have one more question. Before I go to that, we can't end 2020 without predictions. So I'd like to ask each one of you, uh, what is the prediction you have for Blue Tech in the next few years? Zdenka, you're on first. So I will refer to a panel that I actually moderated yesterday for TMA um, Blue Tech and their Blue Tech Week. And it was called, uh, uh, let me get the name of it. Um, it was about connectors and um, so relatively mundane, what you would think connectors in the ocean, three, um, three uh, new companies. And what they've done is they disrupted the business model and the supply chain model for ocean tech. And so I expect that we're going to see a lot more uh, agile uh, companies that um, take the model that they're used to seeing from aviation or transportation. And we're gonna see the um, ocean sensors that are gonna be able to be put together quickly, uh, inexpensively, and still monitor the ocean and do all the missions that we want them to do. Yay, what's gonna happen? Well, from my point of view, and today there is about thousands of maybe under 10,000 robots in the, in the ocean at any given time. So certainly in the future, I would imagine there will be 10 times, 100 times more robots at sea. And today's robots are relatively independent. They behave themselves and then they come to the surface, talk to the satellite in the star network and they don't really interact to each other that much. So in the future, I expect the robot will become smarter and they're able to not only to coordinate themselves and they also relay messages as the early question talked about underwater communication. So that will help you to relay the signal back to shore and to your smartphones. And that will be uh, talk about IOTs and then eventually ocean will become an ocean of things and then have all those robots interconnected I have a smart device and uh, to meet not only the government and military need, but also satisfy the consumer's need as well. Stephen, content going to be king? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, with, with people's um, heightened awareness on, on platforms like Instagram and whether it's Netflix or uh, through virtual reality applications at home, um, you know, the, the uh, Oculus has had great success in delivering headsets for home use now with the, the Oculus Quest 2. Um, and I think that as these different mediums uh, can communicate the uh, messages about the ocean, I think that it's reaching a wider audience. 
And that is certainly our goal, right, is to bring it to, to more and more people around the world that wouldn't have an opportunity to experience it otherwise. Um, so I think that that trend will continue. And hopefully that means that a lot more people will be tuned into what is happening in our oceans and, and, and what the future has to hold uh, and, and what we can learn from something that we know very little about these days. My prediction, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are going into the water very mm -hmm. soon. Um, do we tie, have time, Ravi and Maddie, just to ask, answer this one last question from Yu Ji Cheng? Please do. Okay, uh, Yi, uh, as a computational chemist turned entrepreneur, I'd like to know what, uh, what other entrepreneurs' reactions are when they hear you say you're a computational oceanogra oceanographer. How do you address general public and explain your work? So basically, you, you take for granted, you open your smartphone, you check weather prediction wherever you go to the next vacation or even go to the next destination, go camping. So in the future, uh, 10 years from now, your smartphone will be able to access everything you want to know about the ocean and it's transparent, it's, uh, it's predictable. The competition oceanography is really about integrating all the data set we have been talking about together into a co cohesive manner and able to predict into the future. Um, so basically 20, 30 years ago, you talk about weather balloons, weather stations, but today your smartphone, they take care of it through a cloud computing, through a data storage to deliver this information rather than individual data set to your fingertip to help you to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's the technology that the Hive is funding. So. Ravi and Maddie, uh, any closing remarks? Oh, thank you, Marta. Thank you to all the panelists for just an amazing kind of discussion today. And I want to thank my colleague, Maddie, also for putting this together. Maddie? Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks to this incredible panel of speakers. I'm sure we could have kept going for hours as you guys wanted to, um, our audience members as well. And thank you guys for showing up to our events. I've dropped some links in the chat. So please continue to um, join the Hive Think Tank and follow along on our adventures. Thanks so much. Everyone take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.